Hello, all my wonderful listeners, and welcome to episode 72, which is the last episode in this first series on animal physiology. If you're really digging this series and this kind of content about animals, then don't worry about it ending anytime soon. Animals are hugely complex organisms. They've got a lot more going on inside of them than your typical plant or fungi. And so it'll take me a, a whole second series to really explore all of the major aspects of the animal's body, of their physiology. But that's all that I'm going to say about that for now. Today, I'll complete a series that so far has explored a lot of the fundamentals, like animal development, hydration and nutrition, animal senses, and most recently, animal reproduction. Today's episode rounds out the list of animal fundamentals by exploring how animals move, how they swim, walk, run, jump, and fly, how they turn their eyes, how they clamp down their jaws on prey, all that good stuff. Autonomous movement is one of those really basic things that separates animals from plants and fungi, which is why I'm covering this topic right now at the end of this series just like I covered photosynthesis at the end of the plant physiology series. This aspect of autonomous movement is so integral to the animal kingdom that it was one of the first things I described way back at the very beginning of episode 67. At the beginning of this series, I said that animals, when boiled down to the barest fundamentals, could be described as mobile food tubes. Animals are essentially tubes, which survive by finding food to put in one end of the tube so as to digest it and then excrete the waste out of the other end of the tube. In order to do this, in order to find and capture food, these mobile food tubes had to evolve limbs. And what a breathtaking diversity of appendages and various limbs that have been evolved. Thousands of different kinds of arms and legs meant for moving through all kinds of different environments or for capturing different kinds of prey. It's amazing. Now to get into the nitty gritty details, there are two types of tissues that are necessary for movement, both of which I'll be exploring in great detail in today's episode. The first of these types of tissue is muscle. Muscle tissue is composed of millions of molecular fibers, all running parallel to each other and able to slide or pull past one another. This makes the muscle tissue capable of contracting, and generating a lot of force while it does it, and thus it pulls two points closer together. Now, these points that get pulled closer together are found on the other type of tissue, which is skeletal tissue. In some animals, this tissue is bone, and in others, it's a chitinous exoskeleton. But in either case, the purpose is the same. The skeletal tissue provides a hard, inflexible framework that the muscles can attach to and pull on. When the muscle tissue flexes, it pulls against the inflexible skeletal tissue, and it can cause the limb to bend at a joint, or a tentacle to bend and twist. This basic technique, when grown into the proper physiology, like a healthy horse leg or a bird's wing, enables the animal to move that limb in a controlled fashion and sets of limbs can be coordinated so as to provide balance while standing or moving, and to better interact with and move through the environment. Alright, so to begin, I'll start with muscle tissue. In pretty much all animals with muscle tissue, whether it be in fins or legs or wings or tentacles, it all works on the same general principle at a chemical level. The muscle is composed of filaments that slide past one another to induce contraction. In vertebrate animals, like you and me, there's large, solid masses of muscle tissue that wrap around the skeletal system. Each of your muscles, like your biceps, your quadriceps, your calf muscles, your deltoids, everything, is essentially bundles of bundles of muscle fibers. A single muscle fiber is one cell, one extremely long, extremely thin cell. It spans the entire length of the muscle, from tendon to tendon. The tendons connect the muscles to the bones, but I'll get into this more later. A group of muscle fibers is called a bundle, and a bundle of these bundles 
composes the muscle itself, like your bicep or your calf muscle. These are structured kind of like metal cords used on suspension bridges, with small wires twisted together into a rope, and multiple ropes of these metal wires are all themselves twisted into larger and larger cords that can then hold a tremendous amount of weight. The molecular structures that do the actual pulling, or contraction, exist within the muscle cells, within the muscle fibers. On the largest scale, these structures are called myofibrils. They're contractile filaments that are themselves bundled together into the muscle fiber. The myofibril is really interesting, because if you look at it under a microscope, then you'll see that there's alternating patterns of light and dark segments that run down the length of the myofibril called light and dark bands. A thick, dark line runs through the middle of the light bands, like a series of rings spaced along the length of the myofibril. This is the macroscopic appearance of the thousands of tiny protein fibers that do the actual pulling. These light and dark bands that are visible under a microscope create units called sarcomeres. Each sarcomere is just a unit of the length of the total myofibril, and each sarcomere has a dark band in the middle, with half of a white band on either side. Those thick lines that run through the middle of the light band, they run like a ring on the myofibril, and those are called the Z-line, or the Z-disc, and they define the edges of the sarcomere. So the entire sarcomere goes from one side of a Z-disc to the next Z-disc, down the length of the myofibril. Because the Z-line runs through the middle of a white band, this means that each sarcomere will have that dark band in the middle, and then half of a white band on either side. I know it sounds a little abstract and complicated, but it, it's really important. The light and dark bands within the sarcomere appear this way. They appear light and dark under a microscope because of the density of the proteins in each region. The protein filaments in the light band are called actin. These filaments are relatively thin, and they're anchored to the Z-disc, and they extend in either direction perpendicular to the, to the ring of the Z-disc. They point down the length of the myofibril. These filaments, they're, they're thin, and they're relatively loosely spaced, giving the light band its transparency and its apparent lightness. In the dark band, Instead of actin, there's myosin protein filaments. Myosin makes relatively thick fibers. It's called a thick filament. And along most of its length, the myosin is dotted with hundreds of little lobes, or little finger-like projections poking out. These projections are called myosin heads, and they're responsible for the contraction of the muscle fiber. Now, I'll get into the neural system in a near future episode. So all you need to know for now is that neurons will send a signal to the muscle fibers, which begins the chemical process that ultimately leads to the movement of these myosin heads and to muscle contraction. The neuron's role, as far as the muscle is concerned, is to dump a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine across the membrane of the muscle cells. When this acetylcholine neurotransmitter binds to the receptors on the muscle cell, the membrane depolarizes as the voltage suddenly changes, and this ascent is a pulse of depolarization down the length of the muscle fiber. The muscle cell's membrane isn't a perfect cylinder encapsulating a perfectly cylindrical myofibril. This membrane has little holes. Not really a hole, it's not a puncture in the membrane. It's more like a pocket or a burrow, uh, technically called an invagination in the membrane. And these form structures called transverse tubules, or T-tubules. It's a section of the membrane that literally turns inward and then tunnels all around in between all the myofibrils. These T-tubules are little tiny corridors running through the muscle cells, which are lined with the muscle cell's plasma membrane. That's why it's not really a hole, it's more like this little burrow. And so the depolarization pulse from the neuron's acetylcholine dump uh, that pulse will move along the membrane, including going down all of these T-tubules. On the inside of the membrane, an organelle called the sarcoplasmic reticulum forms uh, sheets, and these sheets all run together to make a sheath of sorts that fills in the space between the T-tubules 
and the rest of the myofibril's surface area. So when a depolarization wave, or an action potential, comes sweeping across the myofibril cellular membrane and down the T-tubule, it can alter the membrane proteins that end up opening sodium channels and flooding the sarcoplasmic reticulum with sodium ions. All of this sodium then leaks into the myofibrils, where it opens up the actin to bind with the myosin heads. Now the actin filaments have places on them that the myosin heads naturally want to bind to. But there's a few barriers that regulate this process. Running along the length of the actin are even thinner protein filaments called tropomyosin, which are anchored to the actin with smaller globular proteins called troponin. When at rest, this troponin-tropomyosin complex runs along the length of the actin, and it rests in such a way that it blocks all of these binding sites. The myosin heads can't find anywhere to bind to, and so they don't bind to anything. They don't contract, and the muscle is relaxed. It's in a relaxed state. However, when the action potential comes in, and sodium ions start flooding the myofibrils, these sodium ions bind to the troponin, and they cause the entire troponin-tropomyosin-sodium complex to shift and twist. Now, it still stays wrapped around the actin but the proteins are contorted and moved in such a way that it reveals the binding sites. Now the myosin heads can come in and readily bind to the actin, at these binding sites that dot the length of each actin filament. Muscle cells are packed with mitochondria, because muscles consume a huge amount of chemical energy in the form of ATP. And this is where ATP really starts to get used in just just a colossal amount. A molecule of ATP will come and bind to a single myosin head, and this will cause the myosin head to release the actin filament. In the following reaction, the ATP molecule is hydrolyzed. It's broken down into a phosphorus ion and adenosine diphosphate, or ADP. And this reaction causes the myosin head to stretch and bend. The head will stretch to reach further up the actin filament, where it comes into proximity of a new binding spot, and it then binds to that new spot. This next part is the key step. It's the actual contraction movement, which is called the power stroke. So far, we have a myosin head that naturally bound to a binding site on the actin filament, and then because of a hydrolysis reaction with ATP, it let go of that binding spot, and then it stretched to reach upwards, where it bound to a new spot that it could reach. Now the myosin head is said to be in a primed position. It's important to mention that the primed myosin head is still bound to the hydrolysis products from the breakdown of the ATP, which are ADP and the phosphorus ion. These are still bound to the myosin head. This phosphorus ion has a huge electronegativity, so when it eventually detaches from the primed myosin head, the resulting conformational change makes the myosin head slam back down, yanking the actin filament along with it. The myosin head making this sudden pulling motion is the power stroke, and it pulls the actin filament along relative to the myosin. When the power stroke is complete, the ADP detaches, and the myosin head is back at rest. It's ready to react with another molecule of ATP and do it all over again. So understand that an ATP molecule has to be spent for every power stroke, for every myosin head, on every myosin filament, and in the course of a single muscular contraction, any particular myosin head will be performing power stroke after power stroke to pull the muscle tissue into full contraction. To appreciate this, we need to step back and look again at the muscle fibril at the scale of the sarcomere. During the muscle contraction, an observer could watch under a microscope as both Z-discs on either end of the sarcomere get pulled closer together. The myosin heads pull on the actin, and the light and the dark bands begin to move together and overlap. The Z-discs get closer, and the entire myofibril contracts. So that is the chemical and cellular basis of muscle tissue. But as with all biological things, 
the reality is much more complicated. There's different kinds of muscle tissue, called cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and skeletal muscle, all with different kinds of behaviors and different cellular arrangements. Cardiac muscle tissue is pretty self-explanatory. It's the muscle tissue that composes your heart. Cardiac muscle tissue has these sarcomere structures, but the muscle tissue is arranged in this strange branching pattern. Intercalated discs connect myofibrils to the myofibrils branching off of them, and this produces a macroscopic effect, wherein the contraction of this muscle tissue isn't pulling point A closer to point B. It's a spherical mass of muscle tissue, and when it contracts, like a heart ventricle, it'll contract from volume A to a smaller volume B, so as to put pressure on the blood within the volume and propagate blood flow. Smooth muscle tissue is composed of cells that don't have sarcomeres. The tissue, it's not striated at all, it's smooth, because the smooth muscle cells are tapered at each end, and they fit together in this overlapping but thin sheet of muscle tissue. This smooth muscle tissue lines the outside of your veins and your arteries, and the outside of the organs of your digestive tract. Both cardiac muscle and smooth muscle are called involuntary muscles, because the animal doesn't consciously control the muscle's contractions. The, the animal doesn't consciously control its heartbeat, or the peristalsis of its esophagus, stomach, and small intestines. Imagine having to manually think about beating your heart. It would be hard to focus on other things, or to sleep, so the body evolved to do it automatically. Both cardiac and smooth muscle are also regulated with the same neurotransmitters. The parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine, and this makes cardiac muscles contract less often, so it relaxes the heart rate. Acetylcholine will activate the smooth muscles and cause them to contract, and in the case of the stomach, it'll cause them to churn and to engage in peristalsis in the small and large intestines, and so on and so forth as to a digestion. These are the relaxing metabolic responses following the rest and digest signals coming from the parasympathetic nervous system. In contrast, the sympathetic nervous system sends out fight-or-flight signals with the release of the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. The sympathetic nervous system also tells the adrenal glands to release epinephrine, or adrenaline, into the bloodstream. These chemicals cause cardiac muscles to contract harder and faster, so as to increase heart rate and blood pressure and blood flow. Epinephrine and norepinephrine largely shut down smooth muscle and prevent it from contracting. This is because if the animal is in a fight or a flight scenario, it needs blood and oxygen and ATP to go to the skeletal muscles and to the cardiac muscles so that the body can fight back or run away and keep the animal alive. When you're in this state of fighting or running for your life, stuff like digestion and peristalsis becomes a pretty low priority. The top priority is moving the skeletal muscle to rapidly manipulate the body so that the animal either fights its attacker or runs away and gives itself a chance to survive. It's a matter of life and death. The stakes are as high as they get, so the secondary stuff, like digestion, gets put on pause. Now, skeletal muscle is the actual muscle that wraps around your skeleton. Skeletal muscle fibers are very long and very cleanly organized. They're arranged in parallel, and they're neatly bundled together, with very clear sarcomeres that create very distinct striations. These hugely long cells are packed with mitochondria and multiple nuclei, just to keep up with the demand for energy and enzymes. Unlike cardiac and smooth muscle, skeletal muscle is voluntary which means the animal can consciously control its contraction. There are, of course, exceptions, like in the case of uh, reflexes, like if you touch something really hot and your arm automatically contracts to bring your hand away from whatever might burn you. But without digressing into the weeds, it should also be explained that skeletal muscle can be divided into three types of fibers, 
which vary in their structure and their optimal function. These three types are fast, intermediate, and slow muscle fibers, which refers to the rate of their contraction. Slow muscle fibers contract slowly, because this type of myosin protein hydrolyzes the ATP relatively slowly. So instead of the myosin heads doing a lot of rapid power strokes, like a dog trying to swim, it's more like a professional rower, who maintains a steady, regular rhythm to their rowing. Despite their slow, steady rate of contraction, they have a lot of mitochondria, and thus a lot of ATP. To fuel their colossal consumption of ATP, the slow muscle fibers need to process a lot of oxygen which is why they have a high concentration of myoglobin. Myoglobin is the protein in muscle cells that carries oxygen, in a rough analogy to the hemoglobin in blood cells. And the iron atom in the myoglobin gives the slow muscle tissue its reddish color. Fast muscle fibers, on the other hand, are a paler color, making muscle tissue that looks white, because it has a relatively low concentration of myoglobin. The fast muscle fibers can contract really quickly, but they don't have as much ATP available, so they fatigue relatively fast. Slow muscle fibers take a long time to fatigue, as they have so much available ATP. All the mitochondria in the slow muscles produce ATP through oxidative phosphorylation, which is, it's really efficient, it's a really good way to produce energy, whereas the fast muscle fibers produce their ATP largely through glycolysis, and this process isn't nearly as efficient. Intermediate muscle fibers are like a blend of slow and fast. They use both glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation, and they appear uh, to be pink, or a, a pinkish red. All the skeletal muscles in your body possess each kind of muscle fiber but different muscles have different ratios of these fibers, depending on their function. For example, your eyeball is mounted into your skull and rotated around with a complex of fast muscle fibers. They can move your eye really quickly and really accurately, but if you move your eyes around too much too fast, the muscles will fatigue and they'll get sore. The muscles in your leg, in contrast, are typically built with much more slow muscle as these muscles are in almost perpetual use. These slow muscle fibers make it so your legs have the endurance to walk or to run enormous distances, or to keep you standing up for hours and hours at a time. Alright, so to summarize, muscles are made of bundles of fibers, and within these fibers are little repeating segments of filaments that pull at each other to overlap and contract the entire length of the fiber. But this contraction is all muscles can do. They can just pull together. In order for this pulling motion, this pulling force, to be integrated into a body and allow the body to move in a coordinated, deliberate way, the muscle has to be mounted on something unmoving, something inflexible. That something is the skeletal structure. The skeleton provides a physical consistency to the organism. It's a hard structure that the soft carbon can grow around, or grow within. Exoskeletons and endoskeletons typically involve hard tissues, like chitin or bone minerals, but there's also hydrostatic skeletons, which are common in soft-bodied aquatic animals. These hydrostatic skeletons are basically an enclosed volume of fluid, which is retained within an organ and held under pressure. And quite like a water balloon, full to the knot with water, this provides a sufficiently solid mass for muscles to attach to, to contract against and relax against, in order to maintain posture, and exert force against the watery external environment. Now this is just a general description of the hydrostatic skeleton. There's a lot of variety here, and if I so desired, I could spend way too much time talking about them all. As just a, a brief glimpse into the diversity of the hydrostatic skeleton, understand that the enclosed organ can take a variety of shapes and sizes to fulfill specific purposes, and the fluid held under pressure within them can be anything from ingested seawater to blood, or even actual soft organs that are packed in and held under pressure, 
like a bunch of smaller water balloons being packed into a bigger water balloon. Consider a worm. Any worm will do, but for the sake of demonstration, uh, let's imagine something simple, like an earthworm. The earthworm has a hydrostatic skeleton, and it moves through a form of peristalsis. Multiple layers of muscle tissue run down the length of the worm laterally, and other muscles ring the worm circumferentially. These antagonistic muscle groups, which are positioned perpendicularly to one another and which work against one another, can induce a dynamic kind of contraction against the hydrostatic organ. They can induce pressure that moves the internal fluid and causes it to bulge up at certain points. The earthworm's body literally shrinks in some places as the muscle contracts and clamps down on the hydrostatic organ, and it will relax and expand in others as the internal fluid is moved around. When waves of contractions move down the length of the earthworm, these bulges of fluid flow down the earthworm's body. They flow down the length of its body. And as they do so, the bulges will push against nearby dirt. And this propels the earthworm through the soil. Arthropod animals, like insects and crustaceans, possess an exoskeleton, which is like a hard outer coating that surrounds and protects the softer internal tissues. In insects, this exoskeleton is produced with proteins and the polysaccharide polymer chitin, while in crustaceans, the exoskeleton is made of calcium carbonate. On the inside of the exoskeleton, growths of chitin or calcium carbonate called apodemes form points where the muscle tissue can attach. Now, vertebrate animals, like reptiles and birds and us humans, among many other terrestrial vertebrate animals, we all have an endoskeleton, or an internal skeleton, and our muscles attach to the outside of our bones, not to the inside like they do with arthropods. However, in both endo- and exoskeletons, the joints are moved by paired groups of muscles that work antagonistically. Remember that muscle tissue can only pull. It can only exert a pulling force. When your muscle tissue relaxes, the tissue can expand, but it's not exerting any force. For example, your bicep can only contract, and this contracting movement pulls your forearm up towards your humerus. Now, there's also a set of muscles that work antagonistically to the bicep, and these are called the triceps. Even though the triceps can also only pull, they're positioned on the other side of the limb, on the other side of the joint, so that when the triceps contract, this pulls the forearm the other way. The arm extends, and this allows the biceps to relax. It's this paired antagonism, this, th these paired muscle groups, that allow joints to move back and forth, and for one muscle to be reset, so as to recontract sometime in the immediate future. The bones of the vertebrate endoskeleton are typically composed of a matrix of calcium phosphate salts, with a little bit of calcium carbonate thrown in, and all of this secreted from bone cells called osteocytes. The joints are the locations where two bones meet, and at the joints, the bones are usually connected with, a, with fibrous connective tissue called ligaments. The ends of the bones themselves are capped in a softer substance called cartilage, which is stiff like bones, but flexible and much smoother than bone. This cartilage in the joints is used to protect the bones from grinding against one another, which can be really painful. The cartilage is also lubricated with fluid and enclosed within a sheath or a sac of ligament, typically called a bursa. This fluid-filled sac uh, in a healthy organism allows the joint to move cleanly and painlessly. Now, the muscles themselves attach to the bones with a fibrous connective tissue called tendons. The tendons are very elastic. They're very springy. They can stretch and increase the flexibility of a joint. But despite all of these qualities, the tendons are really, really strong. It's relatively hard to tear a tendon. Okay, so now we have muscle tissue, and we have what it's attached to. We have the skeletal tissue. Now it's time to look at how all of this fits together to make an animal move. This means, how does the animal walk across the land? 
How does it run, or crawl, or climb, or burrow? How do marine animals swim, and how do birds fly through the air? As animals search for food and water, as they escape their predators, and as they migrate across the landscape, they have to engage in some kind of locomotion. They have to engage in some kind of coordinated, deliberate pattern of muscle movements so as to propel themselves across the physical environment. Exactly how an animal moves, with its crawl, or its jump, or its flying, or its swimming, this depends largely on how the bones are positioned relative to each other, how the bones are shaped, and how the muscles are arranged so as to induce particular forces on the bone and create movement. The angle of the femur coming out of the pelvis, for example, determines the range of motion that the leg is capable of. And within this range, the flexibility and the strength of the associated muscles that move the bone around determines the actual realized range that the animal can move its limb within. Because of these physiological and physical determinants on animal movement, it's possible to examine an animal's skeleton, or its fossils, and derive a huge amount of information about its likely pattern of locomotion and how it moved its limbs. Within the possible range of limb contortions, the animal may use only a limited range, depending on the limb or the speed it's moving at. For example, uh, when an animal is walking, its femur is rotating through a relatively small range of possible movement. When the animal is running, the femur rotates through a much larger range of movement, as the legs are swung back and forth in large strides. The speed of locomotion, like walking versus running, involves changes in posture across the animal's entire body. For example, a, a running person has a different posture, a different gait, different accompanying arm motions and head motions than a walking person. And the same is true for any species of animal when it moves at a relaxed, leisurely pace and when it moves at a fast pace either sprinting across the land, or bolting through the air, or shooting through the water. This is particularly obvious when you look at horses, which will walk slowly, and then they'll move faster into a trot, and then faster into an all-out run or a gallop, each speed being associated with its own body posture and rhythm of movement. In order to move at all, the animal has to engage in a bit of physics. To move forward, the animal has to push back against something. The forces involved in this pushing and propelling forward depend on the environment that the animal is moving within. For example, in water, gravity isn't a huge deal because of buoyancy. But drag is. Water is a relatively dense medium, so moving through it will induce a lot of drag. It can be hard to push through a dense medium with a lot of drag, so this applies a particularly strong evolutionary pressure for aquatic animals to evolve streamlined, torpedo-shaped bodies, or flat bodies that can cut or pierce through the water with minimal drag. It also means that their limbs don't have to be as long or as large, because even short fins flapping in the water can push against the water with enough force to change the fish's direction, or to give it a nice little burst of speed. On dry land, inertia and gravity are the dominant physical forces that animals have to contend with. Because air is way less dense than water, animals that dwell in open air don't really have to fight against drag. Instead, they have to control their inertia so they don't run off a cliff, or so they can accurately jump on their prey. Animals on dry land have to take into account their mass and the inertia of their movement and they have to balance themselves against the force of gravity. This means they often move other limbs besides their legs in order to maintain balance, like a human pumping their arms as they run, or a crocodile using its tail as a counterbalance to strike out at a water buffalo. I should clarify that many species of bird have evolved to be very streamlined, because when you're flying through the air, this is a very energy-intensive process. You don't want to expend any more energy than you have to. And so if you're moving at speed through the air, or if you're trying to be energy efficient, it really helps you to have an aerodynamic body design. And this is why birds have evolved very aerodynamic skulls, 
and their feathers create a very aerodynamic shape. They can just flow through the air. There is a very, very strong evolutionary pressure for an animal to have an efficient means of locomotion. If the animal is a mobile food tube, the mobility aspect of this better be chemically efficient enough so as to be sustained by the food that can be reasonably digested. An animal that has a weird morphology will be an inefficient mover relative to other members of its species, and it'll be outcompeted as it has to eat more to keep up with everyone else. Now, a species that has a weird morphology that induces uh, inefficient movement, that species will likely be outcompeted by other, more efficient organisms that can move around the environment more reliably, with less energy expenditure. This evolutionary demand for efficiency in locomotion has forged species with the fundamental traits that we see today, like animals with bilateral symmetry, animals with paired symmetric limbs, and animals with movement patterns that are rhythmic and dynamic, manipulating the animal's center of balance to allow its body to move at some speed over the rugged, irregular landscape. Furthermore, this landscape itself is dynamic and rhythmic in the sense of summer and winter. Both the dynamic and the immutable characteristics of the environment all contribute to the locomotion strategies of the animal. This, combined with the behavior of the animal, like what it actually does with its limbs, ultimately determines the limb structure and the morphology itself. For example, primate arms and hands have evolved to hang from branches and swing from tree to tree to find, grab, and eat various fruits and leaves. The arms and hands, in this case, are used for both locomotion and feeding, and they possess the dexterity to hold and manipulate things in complex ways, like fruits plucked from a tree, or a bug groomed from a friend's hair, or a rock to be used as a hammer to break open nuts. All of this demonstrates the use of a limb for far more than just locomotion. Perhaps most basically, the total size of the animal plays a really big part in its locomotion. The ratio of surface area to volume is hugely important in biology, and the size of the animal is no exception. This ratio of surface area to volume gets smaller as the animal gets larger, so that the volume increases faster than the surface area does. The surface area is proportional to a length squared, where volume is proportional to a length cubed. And this is important, because an animal's mass is dependent on its volume, and this plays a defining role in the animal's morphology and its evolution. For example, terrestrial animals don't have the buoyancy of water to hold them up, so they have to rely on heavier, sturdier, thicker bones to support their weight. And the bones only get thicker and stronger as the species in question gets larger. On the flip side, a fish whose body has evolved to live in the high-pressure deep ocean will collapse into a limp bag if you bring it up out of the water, and this is because its body can't support itself in the pressure at sea level. The size of an animal also influences how it can move through its environment. Uh, a whale, for example, can easily swim through the water, but its food, which is a tiny little krill, struggles to swim through the water. The water to the krill seems to be dense and thick with drag. In terms of efficiency of locomotion, larger animals actually use less energy per gram of body tissue per distance traveled than smaller animals. Inertia plays a role here too. Elephants move slowly because they weigh a lot, they have a lot of weight, a lot of mass, and thus they have a lot of inertia. A dog is smaller and can move faster. But if you made a dog the size of an elephant, the dog would break its bones and hurt its joints if it continued to move around as fast as a normal-sized dog. Well, without going into an exhaustive list of species and detailed examples of various animals moving around, I think I'll just call it here, while things remain more general and all-encompassing. This was a really fun episode, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I, I hope you learned from it. And if you want more of this stuff, if you want to hear more about animal physiology, 
then come back next week because I'm going to be starting a whole new series, Animal Physiology 2, and that'll just continue the fun by exploring more interesting aspects of animal physiology, like animal gas exchange and the immune system, among others. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, then be sure to come by and check it out. And as always, thanks for listening. Do you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.